All right, thank you for joining everybody. Um, my name is Rachel Sibley. I'm a senior principal quality engineer at Red Hat. Um, I'm working in the automotive department. Specifically, I've been working in the in-vehicle operating system where I'm the um, quality, um, I'm the QE technical lead there. And Luigi, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. My name is uh, Luigi. Oh. Yeah, first mistake. Uh, Hello everyone, my name is uh, Luigi Bellecchia. I'm a principal uh, software quality engineer and I'm working on Rivos in a team where uh, Rachel is uh, leading uh, at Red Hat. Uh, so a look at what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'll give an overview of what the in-vehicle operating system is and what we're trying to do with functional safety certification at Red Hat. Um, talk about the, how we're reusing test coverage from RHEL based on subject matter experts um, evaluation and opinions. Uh, step through an example of GLibc math library, which is in our safety scope, and what that looks like from um, gathering evidence and the process surrounding that. Uh, Luigi then will step into the um, test infrastructure um, side of things. Uh, we'll talk about how we're provisioning the automotive hardware and uh, what the continuous certification looks like um, with using validators. Uh, so if you're not familiar, um, Red Hat is trying to build an operating system that will run in the vehicle, um, in vehicle operating system, but we need to do it safely. So we want to be able to certify it against a standard called ISO 26262. Um, it is derived from RHEL, so it includes all of the same RPMs um, we're inheriting from RHEL. Um, it does have some um, automotive specific RPMs, one of them being the kernel uh, automotive RPM. Uh, which is based on the RT kernel, and uh, a few others that are related to setting up um, the isolation between the safety scope and the non-safety scope, and is based on OS tree um, environment. So we are working on getting it certified um, using the standard ISO 262, um, but we're doing it in a tailored way because the, the standard doesn't really work well with pre-existing software such as Linux. It, we have to comply with this like old standard with the V and V model and doing requirements mapping uh, to test coverage. And in order to do that, we would have to do reverse engineering of all of the upstream um, projects that we're inheriting from. So that doesn't really play nice with Linux. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, what the tailoring looks like in a minute. Um, we're working with a certification body called Exeta. Um, so they're helping us get this certification and do it in a continuous way. And we have a large um, interest engagement from several automotive OEMs and hardware vendors along the way. So the textbook definition of functional safety or short term, uh, short for that is called FUSA, um, is the absence of unacceptable risk that could lead to physical injury um, either to the vehicle itself or to um, the health of people, um, either loss of limb or even death. Um, so what we, whatever we're doing, we have to do it safely, and that's why we're trying to get the certification. Um, so this could be directly or indirectly, um, and by in implementing specific safety-related functions, um, that's what we're trying to do to um, do it in a safe um, manner. Um, so doing, in, doing all of our due diligence to be able to gather specific evidence collection um, and process-oriented to ensure that we're following all the things that we should be, that we claim we're doing. So you can't really talk about FUSA if, unless you talk about ASL. Um, ASL um, stands for Automotive Safety Integrity Levels. Um, it's basically a risk classification system. So um, A being the lowest hazard with D being the highest. Um, ASL A would be something like your rear lights um, not working in the vehicle. But ASL-D would be something like your airbag failing to deploy or your anti-lock brakes um, stopping, uh, all of a sudden to stop working. Uh, so Red Hat is certified against ASL-B. Um, and then if you are able to look at the ISO um, 26262 standard and you're able to stay awake long enough to read through everything, um, there's different classifications throughout the document. Um, a through D and all of the different processes of what you should follow and then depending on what level you're certified against, we'll, we'll have recommendations on what you should do. So for, as far as the certification, we don't have to do this for the entire operating system. That would be a ton of work. Um, so we're limiting the scope to 
a small subset of packages, um, uh, and even like limiting even more with functionality within those packages or RPMs. So um, the operating system is partitioned into two parts, the ASL B scope, um, which is the safety scope, and then QM, which is referred to as quality management. So we need to ensure that we have separation between these two entities. We need to ensure that QM code could not interfere with a supporting um, safety-related function um, or process. So to do that, we have isolation set up using one of our um, automotive-specific RPM, RPMs called QM. So this sets up a containerized environment um, to be able to achieve this uh, isolation. Um, so the functionality and the safety scope, it's defined by narrowing down to a list of APIs as, um, or features, and this is included in these discussions with these uh, subject matter experts um, that we're having these conversations with. And of course, ASLB code requires way more rigor than the QM code. We still need to ensure that like the supporting RPMs, we have these core RPMs that support the safety RPMs are behaving correctly, but we don't have to gather all of this evidence in the same way we would have to with ASLB scope. So to do this, we're um, having interviews, as I mentioned, with RHEL subject matter experts um, for the packages that are in the safety scope. So we have a series of meetings that we conduct with them, and they're generally conducted by FUSA safety experts and technical um, leads. And in these conversations, um, we're highlighting um, argumentation and risks uh, related to these RPMs. Um, and then as part of that, these documents will be created, these risk assessments will be created as part of that. Um, and from the testing side of things, subject matter experts will recommend certain test uh, suites to rerun for safety concerns or um, areas related to the safety scope. Um, so as part of that, uh, there's follow-on activities um, that will result from that. And a big chunk of that is testing. Um, so we want to ensure that we're rerunning the same RHEL tests um, that are identified by the subject matter expert uh, against uh, the in-vehicle operating system and developing new test coverage um, based on risks or gaps um, that are identified. So stepping through an example of GLIPSI math library, so this is an area in the safety scope, what does that mean and what would that look like uh, what, are, what is all the rigor we have to do for that ex exactly? Um, so one follow-on activity mentioned in this risk assessment would be repeat the GLIPC upstream test suite against the, the target hardware. All tests should pass. So for us, that just means we need to take the same test suite that RHEL's running, rerun it in an automotive context against the APIs that are identified by the subject matter expert um, related to math library. So Rerunning them in automotive environment um, means we have to have them converted to TMT, test management tool, um, and they also have to work well in OS3 environment. So a lot of these tests were not designed to work in an OS3 environment, and there are still some areas that are not really running in the standard format, so working with the RHEL teams, um, RHEL QE counterparts to ensure that we're migrating these tests so that they work in the, uh, in the automotive context. Uh, sometimes um, certain test suites, like the GLIPC upstream test suite, is part of the source code. Um, so in able to create or update existing tests, you have to contribute these upstream, and we have to wait for these changes to get backported into RHEL. So there are some cases where we'll patch downstream um, while we wait for these changes to get back into RHEL. Um, so that's running the tests. Then the second part of it is being able to gather specific metadata related to GLIPC math. Um, so what that would look like is hardware details. So the build, what does the build and test environment look like? Um, what are the tools that we're using to run these tests? Um, so that would mean um, like the TMT framework, for example. Um, or the, the tooling that we're using to, to revision and run the tests, uh, the software under test, which be, would be the GLIPC binary, test sources, uh, that would be the GLIPC source RPM, for example, since that's where the tests are bundled in. Uh, the, there's a wrapper script which will handle the installation and building of the test framework. 
Um, what do the expected inputs and outputs look like from the tests? And what are the test results? Um, showing like a clear pass-fail status in the logs. Be able to gather all this information. So we need to be able to gather all of this for all areas of the safety scope. Um, so we're developing automation to be able to do this um, in a more scalable way. There's also witness testing that the um, ISO recommends. Um, so what that would look like is traveling to the data center where the hardware exists. And we have to prove we're running on the same hardware that we claim to run against. So um, being able to flick our some LEDs to show that we're running on the actual board that we're running these um, tests against. Uh, providing evidence that we're actually testing against the system libraries versus the built-in libraries. Um, running a sampling of tests um, by not only just running passing tests, it's more important actually to show that we're caught raising all of the signals and expected faults by um, invoking error injection tests. Um, so what that would mean is taking like the generated C uh, tests and then tweaking values that could cause and raise all of these different signals to ensure that the framework is catching these appropriately, logging them um, in a clear way, um, in a verbose way. So showing the output, um, comparing it against the expected results, recording our results, signing off. So that's about, that's kind of what it would look like if you have to do in-person witness testing. Everything we're doing, um, what, everything I've stepped through, we're, we're trying to automate and try to make it uh, something that we can run and scale for all areas, uh, as I mentioned, in the, in the safety scope. I'll hand it off to Luigi. He can talk about what we're doing for the test infrastructure side of things. Thank you, Grazie. Hi. Hi, everyone. Again, um, we will see uh, our automotive test infrastructure and uh, later an overview about uh, our, con our workflow we are trying to design to achieve continu to continuous certification for functional safety. So, uh, I'm a quality engineer uh, first, so our goal here is to, to describe you know, tooling that we, tools that we are using, um, essentially, mostly for the ones that are really new to those tools, because I see some familiar faces here. So, um, we designed the, um, in Atredata an internal tool named Test Console that is essentially um, an entry point for our test infrastructure at the moment. So it's collecting all users and automation requests from users and automation. It's just provide a few uh, features like uh, for, uh, for users, it provides a user interface to simplify the configuration of the request and something also for the automation like uh, schedule a large uh, test plan uh, based on hardware availability, but it's uh, just uh, providing additional features on the real uh, test infrastructure that is uh, mostly based on uh, testing farm that is an open source tool. We will see some details later. Uh, the testing farm is able to provision uh, the test environment, so the system under test that is named in the slide uh, like suit. And uh, it's able to execute the test using uh, uh, another tool that is a, a test management tool uh, that is TMT. So testing farm will provision uh, a virtual machine named worker and will, and also the system under test and the, the worker will trigger the test execution on the suit via SSH. This is the, the high level overview. So two words around uh, testing farm. It is an open source tool available on gitlab.com. Is a testing system as a service tool. So it's used to provision uh, virtual machine with a large set of distribution, but is also used to uh, provision physical hardware. Uh, here is uh, the, our interest for automotive, uh, mostly. But it's also used to provision virtual machine for uh, other uh, kind of workload. So it comes with um, uh, an HTTP API and a CLI tool that are really convenient way to integrate in a CI, CD workflow. And uh, it also provides a web user interface to navigate the test report and test artifacts. As I said before, the test execution is uh, mostly um, provided by another tool that is uh, an open source Python project. 
This is available on GitHub. It's a, a test management tool. So essentially, uh, this tool pro provides uh, several features, but we uh, want to describe here uh, not the part related to the test workflow. So essentially, it uses a metadata file to describe the test cases and test plan and user stories. So for test cases, uh, it provides uh, an abstraction layer that uh, allows us to run any kind of uh, test suite written in any language. So I'm running those test suites in the same way. And uh, for test plan, uh, give us uh, the opportunity to describe uh, in many details uh, all the steps of the test execution. So from uh, the discovery, so which test we want to run with uh, several criteria like tags, uh, regular expressions, and uh, uh, so on and also provide uh, a way to describe in configuration file, you know, those FMF metadata file um, hardware uh, specification. So you, it's also enabled uh, in the last months uh, uh, support for multi-host, so you can trigger the execution on, uh, in parallel to different um, tar uh, target environment. And you can specify in configuration file also um, information about uh, the preparation, so packages that you need to prepare the environment, how you want to collect reports, and how to clean up the system. And uh, everything is, uh, um, can be um, defined, as I said, in a metadata file, and you have also the opportunity to specify multiple scenarios in the same, uh, uh, in the same plan, because uh, TMT allow you to use a context variable that can be used to, uh, ex to let's say, to enable or disable piece of the configuration based on uh, some uh, um, uh, some sh test scenario. No, for imagine that uh, if you want to run, for example, uh, the same test with code coverage, you can enable some preparation step, some finish step to uh, enable code coverage and to collect artifacts at the end. It's just um, an example. And um, another useful feature that uh, worth it to mention is uh, that DMT uh, is a structure to support uh, inheritance based on the folder structure. So it's a really convenient way to avoid the code duplication. So uh, now we know that we are using a testing farm to provision an hardware and DMT to run uh, our test on, on that hardware. So here is an overview on how we are able to provision physical hardware. So essentially, a user request uh, that comes to Testing Farm uh, have some information about the hardware. And the Testing Farm, a piece of Testing Farm named Artemis, uh, is able to call um, something that we call pool. Thanks. That are uh, essentially um, an abstraction about a set of hardware. So it's, um, let's say, a web application that runs uh, a flasher daemon, so a service, uh, that is able to, uh, to provision a board. We, we have attached to each board another additional hardware that we name Sidekick, so the, the flasher will receive the request from Artemis and will ask the sidekick that is able to manage also the power cycle of the board to flash a particular board. So once the board is ready, uh, another piece of, of testing farm, so the worker will start the test execution against the system under test, so the board via SSH. So uh, we can create pool for a different set of hardware. So our goal in automotive is really to support uh, a large set of, um, at, uh, of, uh, of boards. So that is a, a, a great way to automate the provisioning in automotive. So uh, let's discuss a bit about uh, continuous certification. So we are targeting an initial certification for Rivos 1.2 that is, uh, as Rachel said, uh, focused on uh, a subset of uh, packages. So we, at the end, will have a set of RPMs with a specific release and version that are part of our initial certification. So from that point uh, on, we need to find a way to create, to test, create the evidence on each version and understand if we can promote those RPMs to the new uh, Rivos release. 
And um, so on doing so, uh, we are creating a, a framework and um, that's supporting this workflow that is uh, introducing a, a gating mechanism that uh, essentially uh, will use uh, testing validators and will perform comparison with the previously certified version of the same RPM. So talking about gating, as a QE, we generally speak about test gating. So we uh, did we uh, execute test gating for uh, an image uh, for arrivals release and for packages. So our test scope for all those cases are defined in a configuration file, and uh, uh, for arrivals release we run a comprehensive test cycle that are a set of uh, rel uh, applicable uh, tests, and also uh, all the package testing for um, for arrivals release. And for any new release of, of a package, we trigger test execution of downstream and upstream test suite that are applicable for arrivals. So, uh, but why we need uh, um, validators? So imagine that we are going to run a large test suite like uh, glibc or any other uh, test suite with a thousand of tests. So uh, having an, an overall uh, test result is not enough because uh, we really need a level of granularity that allow us to say for those particular API we are able to run those particular tests because talking with maintainers so we define you know, that the coverage is done uh, that way. So we need uh, uh, a way to extract from uh, a large test suite execution information about uh, single test cases. And so um, the validator not have in charge this kind of verification, but is also evaluating quality KPI that are not only related to testing activities. So for example, bug analysis, code reviews, uh, documentation, and uh, static analysis. And everything is done in comparison with the previous uh, qualified uh, uh, version of the same tool. So, uh, that's uh, so it's the overview that I'd like to, sh to share with you. If you have any questions, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, why did you fork the real time kernel and made a new version of the kernel, the automotive one? Uh, well, there, oh, why did you fork the real time kernel um, versus using the existing kernel? Uh, there are some changes that we need for automotive that would not work well or be meaningful to the RHEL kernel. So we have different configs. We have specific hardware enablement that we're contributing, that's being contributed upstream and then backported to this automotive kernel. Um, it also allows us to sort of like, low, you know, minimize the scope of the automotive kernel. Um, the smaller scope that we can do for um, these areas in the FUSA scope um, the less area of concern, uh, especially when you were talking about safety scope. Yep. Rachel, um, so, you know, we're almost at the milestone of getting certified with mass certification, if I understand correctly. Um, what is the next milestone then for drivers? What would be the next thing that we all focus on in terms of getting certified, or is that it? Or is that what would make and bring the business? Uh, yeah, so the question is, well, what is, uh, we're getting close to getting a uh, certification in hand. Uh, I can't talk about schedules or, or timelines about that, um, but what would be the next steps for Red Hat, and specifically the uh, automotive um, um, organization? Uh, so we'll be doing a certification with a specific um, hardware in mind, or it might be a multiple hardware, um, but once we do that, the, the main thing after that is just to ensure we have continuous certification for that specific release. So we'll have our first release that we'll um, have delivered at, at GA general availability timeframe. And then after that, there will be um, more opportunities for other automotive OEMs to be able to um, be interested in our work. And we'll have additional releases to support those automotive OEMs and hardware vendors. And if we can do this for automotive, it'll open up other opportunities within different industries like medical, industrial, um, uh, that sort of thing. So um, this would be just the beginning. And if I can just follow up, so you would have to get certified for each individual hardware, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you, do you have to, is a certification tied to the hardware? And the answer is yes. I'm just curious. Okay, uh, sorry, can you repeat it? <laughs> oh. oh, what kind of test suites do we use for kernel? Uh, so as we were talking about earlier, we're rerunning all of the same test suites from RHEL. So a lot of the test suites um, that are being identified by the subject matter experts when we're getting into the kernel-related risk assessments are actually coming from LTP. Yeah. Um, but then there are some test gaps that are being identified where we'll have to go and work with the RHEL QE counterparts, develop new tests, and then contribute them back to RHEL, contribute them back upstream to LTP project. Um, so I'm hoping that everything we're doing for automotive is, being val is, is valuable for RHEL, as we're improving the safety not only for our operating system, but for RHEL uh, as a whole. Yes, uh, for RT kernel testing, are we reusing some of the RT um, kernel test suites that are available for RHEL? And yes, um, the answer is um, we're rerunning a lot of the same RHEL test frameworks, including the RT kernel testing, uh, like RT val and all of those sorts of things. So yeah, we are rerunning those as well. Yeah. I suppose the, uh, the ISO standard uh, asks for uh, having written uh, requirements for the functionality. And if that's so, did you need to uh, write those requirements for the existing functionality of uh, the RHEL packages? Yeah, do we have to have requirements mapping to test coverage uh, for this certification? And that's sort of what I was talking about earlier, that in order to do something like that and have compliance with this uh, ISO standard, we would need to reverse engineer all the requirements from all of these upstream projects that we're inheriting from, and then make sure that we have traceable tests for every requirement, like using man pages and that sort of thing. And that would take us like hundreds of years <laughs> if we had to do something like that. So we are not actually using requirements, we are instead using something we call um, safety concerns. So with safety concerns that are identified by these subject matter experts, we're ensuring that we have the proper test cases covering uh, these, these uh, safety concerns mentioned in the interviews. Any other questions? They're really good questions. <laughs> yes. Do you work with hardware redundancy in a way that, or do you, is there a you know, requirement for uh, doing something like computing the same software on multiple processors? and then comparing the results so that you ensure that uh, if one processor has some uh, hardware failure or some, uh, yeah, uh, it's not, not computing correctly that you can detect that by comparing the two output? Uh, will we have hardware redundancy um, with the... the C And there, the answer is no. There is no fault tolerance. The question. The question oh. <laughs> is there hardware redundancy um, going to be used for the in-vehicle operating system? And the answer is no. There is no, uh, at this time, no hardware um, tolerance or fault, fault redundancy. Tolerance. Fault tolerance, thank you, uh, for the hardware. Other questions? All right, well, thank you everybody for